Yes, sir. Okay, right. So, uh, good evening to everyone. And uh, right at the outset, I thank Dr. Sabu for giving me yet another opportunity to share details of a very important topic. And the topic is about digital economy. Digital technology has become a part of our everyday life. It has actually disrupted our uh, style of living compared to what it was 10 years back. Uh, our communication has changed, our entertainment has changed, our professional interactions have changed. Even now, the way we uh, maintain friendships, etc., everything has changed. Suddenly, you find the whole world at your, uh, on your table through your laptop or mobile, and you're able to establish communication. Now, it is having an impact on the economy as well. So I'm going to speak about digital economy today. Some of you may be very familiar with the subject, uh, but my aim is to bring it very simple for the understanding of all the people who are here in this webinar. I'll also touch upon how digital economy has evolved in India, how it has progressed in the last, let's say last 10 years, and what is the future uh, promises it holds for us? What would be its impact on our economy, on our country's GDP? So these are the issues which I'm covering in my presentation. I will upload my presentation uh, now. Can you uh, see my yes, presentation sir. now? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's clear. You can see my presentation. Yes, sir. Okay. So I will go to a simple statement about which everybody knows. Indian economy is today 3.3 trillion and we just got to the fifth position after overtaking UK sometime last month. And if you look at the breakdown, agriculture is 16, industry is 30%, services are 54%. Where is the digital economy in this? Or is it there in all these sectors? That is what we need to understand. How is digital economy to start with? How is it defined? How is it uh, uh, linked with activities in various sectors? So I will take you through this path first. So let's go to the next slide. So I will introduce that digital economy is omnipresent, as I mentioned earlier. It was known by many names earlier. They used to call internet economy. They used to call web economy. But now the term digital economy has come to stay world over. All organizations are calling it as digital economy. So digital economy, for benefit of you people, I've just broken down to three parts. One is digital infrastructure. In digital infrastructure, which is in blue color, you have the hardware, you have the software, you have people giving you consultancy, you're able to communicate with people. All these functions are a part of digital infrastructure. When you're utilizing this infrastructure for <clears throat> digital services, for e-governance and also maintaining the entire network as a platform, that the transactions which take place there comes as digital economy level one. But in level two, which is in green color, it goes one step higher. There's e-commerce, which we all know, Amazon, Flipkart, etc. Then there is e-business, which is carried. Then there is precision agriculture, which is being followed these days. A lot of digital applications are coming into agriculture by which the 
input amount of fertilizer, water, etc., are controlled by a program which basically depends upon the soil status after doing a study of the soil. And the industry side, there's industry 4.0 applications, which are bringing in digital aspects into production, into design, into quality control, into safety, and so many aspects in the industrial activity. So digital economy, you can see it in three levels, but we look at the overall part of it at the economy level, but you need to understand there is infrastructure created which has to be exploited by people for the services and also for industry, agriculture, business, etc. Now, digital economy pertains, as I mentioned earlier, to economic outcomes of digital transaction. It is not just making payment. You may be making payment, that is the financial part. You may be applying for a driving license and getting it. That may be the administrative part of it. You may be applying for leave and getting it approved. That is another example, simpler example. It is used for governance. It is used for manufacturing. It is used these days for education, healthcare, etc. So digital economy, which is being practiced by individuals as well as organizations are contributing in a big way towards the national economy. But all of us are very familiar with financial transaction. So what happens in a financial transaction? Very briefly, I'll just tell you, when you do a financial transaction, time is saved for the customer. Otherwise you would be doing it by going to a bank or going to an ATM. You're saving the efforts of the customer, you save time. Productivity is improved for financial institutions because you find in a fixed amount of time, more transactions take place. It is cashless. So less currency notes are required. So the number of the amount of currency notes required to be printed and distributed is less. There is transparency as you follow a standard procedure of predetermined rules. And there is traceability, which is very helpful while you're doing accounting and auditing. So every time you do a digital transaction, financial transaction, these are the benefits. Same is the case with administrative transaction. In that point number three may not be there. It is not cashless transaction. That may not be applicable, but you don't have to go and uh, meet a person personally to do the job. It is a faceless transaction. And these sort of transactions benefit the individuals as well as the organizations, and therefore the society and the nation, which brings savings to us and increases our productivity. But, but, there is no common measurement for digital economy. Uh, this is as per OECD, this is the Organization for Economic uh, Cooperation and Development. There is no fixed way of measuring digital economy. How much is digital economy? How much percentage does it contribute? Does it form a part of our global uh, GDP or national GDP? But there are some reports say it is 15%. But it is not measured on a uniform scale, which is applicable across the globe. People interpret in a different manner. So this is one factor which we should keep in mind when somebody says we will have so much percentage of digital economy, then it is not on a standard measurement technique. The other factor is digital economy is always associated with capital expenditure. You have to set up infrastructure. It could be computers, it could be softwares operating in it, it could be fiber optic connections, it may be networks, it may be, and so many people required for making sure all these things work. So there are operational expenses 
and capital expenses. This is something which we have to remember that it does not happen just like that. You have to invest some money to benefit out of this technology. And the expenses in setting up a digital infrastructure or digital systems are, as I mentioned earlier, hardware. There is software required for cybersecurity and various authorizations. There's maintenance required for monitoring as well as making sure redundancies are available. Energy is required for keeping all these digital systems active 24 seven. It is round the clock, it has to operate, and therefore there's a standby supply required. All this entailed to investment. And digital transactions can then take place 24 by seven. They are cost effective only if the volume of transaction is very high. If the volume of transaction is low, then they are not cost effective. You don't break even, you lose money. So instead of enabling the economy, you will be actually spending more than what returns you get. So the most important aspect is you have to ensure the volume of transactions have to be high, which means it has to be popular. That is the catch word. People have to accept that we can utilize this digital transaction as a safe, reliable, speedy, and trustworthy transaction. So benefits of digital economy are, I'll just quickly go this point. There is higher cash velocity. I'm using a technical term. That means if, let's say there are 50 of us having two lakhs of cash with us, but we use only digital transaction, the cash is not moving. The, but the cash is moving only digitally and the physical cash is not moving. So you have a higher cash velocity in the digital domain. Physically, currency notes are not exchanged much, which means you can print less currency notes. And in our country, we have to import paper, which is required for building, uh, printing currency notes. We have to even import the ink. So less imports of ink and paper, less printing. Another advantage is, Whatever transaction you do, it leaves a trail in the digital domain. So therefore, transactions are more white and less black. It's an advantage. Slowly, slowly, it'll become more white and black reduces, diminishes. Since they are in the digital domain with a trail, the tax base gets widened. People's transactions come under preview of the authorities and therefore uh, the transactions are taxable. So the number of people paying tax will increase and we become a tax compliant society. And of course, the government will collect more tax and more revenue for whatever pro other programs they want to do. So if digital economy is practiced, all these benefits are there and the more volume of transactions you do, all this will improve, velocity becomes higher, printing is less, more white, wider. Every benefit will become further strengthened when the volume goes up. So the challenge is that you have to make it popular and make the volume of transactions very high. So what does the government do? or what has the government done? So I'll talk about bank accounts and some of these factors are known to all of us. Government made all government subsidy payments and welfare schemes only through bank accounts, no cash. So digitally they meant volume of transactions went up and this started in August 14. Banks were permitted bank accounts even if it is zero balance. This is an incentive to make sure people maintain the accounts. As and when they get cash, there'll be some transaction. Banks provided interest on balance and also paid RUP debit cards to enable them to make payment digitally through the debit cards. 
Therefore, transactions went up, and that was our aim to make the transactions high. Linked Jantan accounts to Aadhaar and mobile number, and thereby made it secure, and also it became unique. And this created a lot of trust in the people who are having the account. Today, we have 46 crore bank accounts, and most of them were opened in rural and semi-urban areas. And this is a very important aspect that means the digital transactions have spread to rural and semi-urban areas, making it more popular, more transactions. That's a very important aspect. 56% of the account holders became are women. So the family members are also into digital transactions. Thereby, the number of transactions have increased. And today we got 1.74 lakh crores lying in Jantan accounts as savings from people. And they are utilizing those accounts, mostly digital method. Of course, they can take cash if they want but most of them are using digitally. And most importantly, the digital economy has given dignity and affordability to the poorer section. They have bank account holders. They are able to use ATM cards which have been given to them. RUPA debit cards are being given to them free. There are RUPA Kisan cards separately for their transactions, specific to fertilizer and other things. So digital economy got initiated, got a big push when these measures were taken by government and it got practiced by more number of people. Volumes became high and the returns started coming to economy. Benefits start coming to the economy. Similarly, financial transactions through mobiles were started or permitted, authorized by government. Initially started by ICICI Bank as an additional channel for making payment. But it became very popular after demonetization with mobile apps coming, with wallets being created with, you know, in mobiles. Then subsequently payment apps like Google Pay, Phone Pay, and something else got integrated with bank accounts. But the important aspect is all this integration took place through a common interface called Unified payment interface, UPI. This UPI is a product of a government-owned PSU, National Payment Corporation of India. They created this unified payment interface and through that, all the transactions were taking place with the bank. So when you pay by Google Pay from your account to another person, it actually goes to UPI. Similarly, phone pay, when you are transacting, it goes through via UPI, and UPI is the one which holds all the bank accounts, more than 300 bank, I'm sorry, not bank accounts, banks. More than 300 odd banks are being held together by this UPI for digital transaction. Initially, UPI was charging only 90 paisa per transaction, but from 2019, it has made it free for RUPA customers. If you have an RUPA card, then your UPI is free to you. And this has made it extremely popular, thereby the more transactions took place, more transactions means more benefits to the economy. Now, as, of, as we speak today, UPI has made it totally free. First is 90 paisa, then you said they will not charge for RUPA holders, and now it has become zero paisa. So all the payments through UPI has become free of any service charges on the customer. Customer doesn't have to pay any money, while banks will have to make some payment for that. So a little more on UPI. People say UPI is the most successful technical innovation in our country. The most successful digital innovation which has happened in our country is UPI. It is safe, efficient, accessible, inclusive, interoperable, 
and internationally popular. I'll talk more about it as we go along. And it operates on a push-pull concept. You can send money and you can seek money. I'm sure some of you must be already knowing it. But in case you don't know it, I'll just show you a picture. You have a payer and you have a payee. You can push money from your account to the payee's account or the payee can pull money from his, your account to his account. It may be your son who's studying in a hostel and you want to send 2,000 rupees to him this month. Alternatively, he can seek 2,000 rupees from you and you can approve it and the money will go. So it operates in this push-pull method which makes it transactions bi-directional, initiation bi-directional, and this has actually increased the number of transactions, more transparent, of course, and it has made it extremely popular. Today, as I mentioned earlier, UPI is integrated with 358 Indian banks. Um, there are no foreign banks so far. I'll talk about it foreign banks a little later but there are 358 Indian banks integrated with UPI and their monthly transactions are number of transactions. I'm not talking about amount, number. 670 crores of transactions take place every month on average. You send 2000 rupees to your son is one transaction. Like that 670 crore transaction takes place through UPI every month and the amount is nearly 12 lakh crores. So this much of digital transaction taking place without cash, without requirement of currency, has huge benefits to our economy. And that benefit today is called digital economy. It is established in, UPI is established in many countries in our neighborhood, Bhutan, Bangladesh, some Southeast Asian, some countries. In fact, Singapore, uh, their main bank has already tied up with UPI to have a similar system by which they will have UPI equivalent in Singapore. I mean, our people there can be operating through their cards, through the UPI in Singapore. It is also there in the UAE, it is there in France, it is there in the EU. So it has almost become very popular in many other countries. And then they brought a 2.0 version where even credit cards of RUP were permitted. Normally, cash transactions don't take place on credit card uh, unless you are uh, with the credit card bank. But now UPI is permitting RUP credit cards uh, to do it, which has made it a little more popular. And they have brought a new scheme called UPI123 which is meant for non-smartphones, just on audio, voice-based payment system. This is especially required for uh, rural areas where uh, smartphones are not yet become popular or they have uh, connectivity issues. So they have made a module for even those. And now UPI is targeting Indian diaspora for transfers to India, instead of going through SWIFT, and some of you are in business or in banking will know what is a SWIFT. SWIFT is a mechanism by which uh, foreign exchange, uh, I'm sorry, foreign transactions are routed through, uh, especially when, when you had to do it through dollar. So now, and they charge you money for every transaction. So now UPI is looking at creating an alternative to SWIFT so that we are able to uh, do it. In fact, the beginning of this, as I think has just happened with Russian oil companies, when India has been buying oil from Russia uh, during, the, uh, during the ongoing uh, Ukraine war, many of uh, the transactions, recent transactions have taken place through Indian banks avoiding SWIFT and thereby uh, the sanctions of US. It's, a, it's another topic for uh, discussion. So uh, I will just stop it here on UPI. You can see the UPI has, has been a very, very successful uh, innovation. And uh, we have gone through this slide. So now today's digital payments in India, the total number 
I'm not talking the amount, the number. 40% of world's payments, digital payments are made in India. You can see 2022 figures. Compared with China, we are more than double of China. And in 2025, we'll be very close, three times as of what's happening in China. China is the next number two. Number one is in India. Uh, USA is there. You can make your own conclusions. Uh, so digital payments in India, the amount may not be very high, but people are practicing digital payments. Number of transactions are high. Digital infrastructure is getting utilized, and that is adding to our economy. If you look at this, in 2005, only 3% was digital and 92% was cash. In 2020, it is almost 60-40. And is expected, it will be 40-60 in 2025. So we are very close to 50-50 now in 2022. Uh, it is 50% cash. I'm talking the amount and 50% digital. So it's a great transition which we have made. Uh, black is becoming less, white is becoming more. If you look at the UPI, which I talked about earlier, the UPI utilization is much more than credit cards and debit cards, as you can see. This has become very, very popular through the apps which are on your mobile. So all your Google Pay, Phone Pay, they all go through UPI. Now, I just want to touch upon the RU Pay card facilities very briefly. Because this is one of the important measures the government has taken to popularize it. It was launched in March, March 12 and got popularized through Genton accounts, as I mentioned. Today, there are 60 crore people who are having RUP cards. And uh, the credit card got issued in 2017 and got later linked with UPI, as I told you. Most important, in Jan 20, RUP stopped any service charges which is called merchant discount rates it is free this has become so popular as compared to visa and mastercards visa and mastercards which are otherwise popular earlier now suddenly find arupe is not uh, charging any money on the user therefore the number of arupe transactions are more than that of visa and master but the government has compensated uh, NPCI by giving 1300 crores for the loss due to above discount. And more importantly, RUP card has become now popular abroad as well. So RUP card has got nil charges and whatever discount which they are otherwise supposed to pay, the government is separately paying to the owner of RUP card, that is NPCI. Who has done the UPA as well. So, two major measures one, bank accounts, number two, UPI, and now the number three, RUPA. These three things has popularized the transaction digitally across India. So, the consolidation which took place between 2015 to 2020, that's a summary of what I've told you till now. It has consolidated through a various slew of initiatives which I talked about. Uh, we are the number one position, as I told you earlier, we have overtaken China. It's about 2.7 times now. It is 40, 60 in 2020 and become 60, 40 in 2025. That means more digital and less cash. And Arupe card has offered free services. And what has happened, Visa and MasterCards have raised the issue with the U.S. government saying RUP card is giving services free, which is affecting their business in India. And uh, U.S. government has uh, reacted in a different plane when these issues were brought up, uh, some of which are uh, in the strategic sector, some of which are in the... Uh, other foreign relations sector, so that I will leave it aside. But the fact is, RUP card has dented popularity of Visa and MasterCard. The most important thing I would like to tell you is if you're traveling and you're in an airport, and if you're having an RUP card, you walk into the lounge without any problem. 
if you have a visa card or a master card it may not be 100% assured it will depend upon it will depend upon who has taken the contract for the launch but rp card is just walk through okay now there are certain other initiatives which have been brought in by the government to boost uh, digital economy and i would like to just talk about this first is gati shakti in october 21 this digital platform has been made you can see the photo there there's a highway there's a port there's an airport and there is also renewable energy uh, setup solar energy now this digital platform has been created to bring in 16 different ministries and state governments for planning coordinating and monitoring infrastructure projects which pertain to roadways airports railway cargo handling a transmission network renewable energy etc now by bringing all the concerned people on one digital platform it has made them more accountable of course they are using also uh, uh, techniques by which they are able to keep track of the progress which is making it is expected that projects will get executed faster anything you do faster it is at a lower cost especially infrastructure projects so the government will benefit the economy will benefit by making sure execution of projects are more coordinated and they are using blockchain technologies to make sure there's a trail available of every transaction every administrative transaction uh, which takes place uh, on this gati shakti platform uh, it's a very very uh, innovative step is the government has taken i am not very sure whether uh, the projects have started on gati shakti this is just about a year now but i am told that all new projects which are going to start in here and after will go through gati shakti all the old projects if they are about 80% or 90% completed then it not be worth bringing them to this but projects which are less than 50% may migrate to gati shakti that detail i don't have but it, this is a great initiative which has been done the second one is more interesting it's called ulip unified logistic interface platform this was released in july 22 today in india for exports 13 to 14% cost is on logistics while in rest of the world it is around 7% it is not that they are using digital and we are using less digital no our procedures of export clearance customs clearance port clearance a clearance from some other administrative department all these are in islands they are all in separate separate platforms and one has to go from one platform to another very often by paper and not digitally they are all having individual digital uh, setup but the final approval comes in paper and you take that paper put another 10 set applications and go to customs customs will give some approval you take that and then go to port so to bring all the people on a unified logistic interface government has launched this digital service for road rail and waterways transportation it has been launched by this multi mode transportation custom clearance as well as port clearance everything will take place through this and is expected our exporters will have a less cumbersome process and thereby save cost save time and of course save a lot of uh, money which otherwise they spend on giving a service charges to people all those will they will save and we will be able to encourage more experts and please remember more experts means more gdp
That's straightforward one-to-one -one relation. So if you can increase exports by reducing the cost internally spent by the exporters, then the chances of getting more exports and increasing the economy is assured. The next one, I don't know how many of you know about this ONDC. It has been launched in five cities and one of them is in Coimbatore in December 21 by Department of Promotion Industry. Now, this is essentially to promote vendor local merchants who are manufacturers who have products which they can put on a digital platform. And this digital platform will be accessible by, of course, the local population, as well as whoever is on ONDC. Essentially, it is to reduce the monopoly of big players like Amazon, Flipkart, etc. Today, Amazon and Flipkart buys from a merchant or buys from a manufacturer who doesn't have a digital platform of his own. He's not that rich. Amazon buys it and sells it to you and charges some money. Now, there's an ONDC network created by the government by which the local merch, local manufacturer can go to ONDC, sell the same item, and perhaps get more money than what he was getting from Amazon. And the customer also will be able to buy it at a lower cost than Amazon. So these services, uh, delivery services, as well as the item cost have been unbundled and the customer can choose from whom he want and how the item should be delivered to him. It's a great initiative. It's in the first one year of uh, trials. Uh, in five cities, it has been started. And I presume this will pick up and it will spread to uh, other cities. I said, I said five countries, I'm sorry, five cities. And it will expand to other cities as well. The last initiative, you must have read in the papers. Digital currency is coming. As per budget, they're supposed to come in FY 22, 23. So RBI is going to introduce a digital rupee. It's a legal tender. Don't confuse with Bitcoin. This digital rupee will be a legal tender guaranteed by RBI. So what will happen if Dr. Sabu has got five lakhs in his bank and he finds he is not uh, uh, requiring that much of money in the cash, then he can convert, let's say, two lakhs of that five lakhs into digital rupee. He will create a wallet of two lakhs and RBI will put two lakhs digital rupee in his wallet when you give two lakhs check to him, RBI. So it is no more in physical domain. It, it is available to you as a digital rupee and you can make payments on the digital rupee to another person who's also got a digital rupee account. So what happens is you don't have to transact. First of all, there's definitely cashless. This is also common with digital currency. But there's another advantage. All these transfers take place through blockchain technology. It's a common uh, 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 book in which all the entries are made. So wallet to wallet, entries are made in the common uh, account. The banks are not involved now. RBI can monitor the trail, but uh, your Indian bank or SBI or some other bank is not involved. you got a wallet from RBI and you can pay Dr. Sabu can pay through that wallet to another person who's having an RBI wallet. So with the result, the services of bank will get cut a little bit. Of course, they will lose the money as well. And the bank also will have some less cash with them. I'm told uh, that if the bank has got deposits worth X crores, they are supposed to keep a percentage of that by way of cash or they are permitted to hold it and that they can give some loans, this, that, etc. Now, when bank has gone away, when, when you go to digital rupee, the bank is having less money in Sabu's account 
and therefore what will happen is banks will have a reduction of cash with them and their ability to give loans will get constrained this is a this is a disadvantage of digital rupee there could be some more disadvantages it is not yet rolled out but i am told rbi is going to roll out in two phases first they will give digital rupee option to people who have got current account who got very high uh, uh, deposits with uh, with their banks who have got high withdrawal uh, levels so they will give it to those corporate people and phase 2 little later after studying this uh, new system how it will fan out they will give it to retailers retailers means people like you and me we can also have a digital rupee account with the rbi but one thing is clear currency management system will become more efficient with less physical currency that means you don't have to print so many notes you don't have to import ink and paper and your transactions will be either digitally from sbi or whichever bank or through rbi's wallet through digital rupee so these are two types of we are going to higher level of digital transaction in the coming years and this could be a future many countries have already started this and soon by next year uh, we should be having uh, rbi as digital rupee phase 1 launched and we could perhaps uh, read more about it in what will come in the public domain so with this i come to my conclusions there's no doubt digital transactions are speedier more transparent more accurate higher cash velocity easy in accounting and audit but it requires capital investment and operating cost which we discussed earlier so you have to make the usage high so that cost per transaction is low therefore the challenge is to ensure wide utilization to have a positive contribution to gdp productivity of individuals productivity of organizations many individuals a high percentage of your population and very high percentage of various organizations they all go digital so their contribution to gdp will become more which we discuss the benefits of digital gdp and this the government has tackled through then jantan accounts upi and arupay the three things which i told you and now they are pursuing gati shakti for projects ulip for logistics cost and ondc for tapping the capability of small merchants in urban as well as semi urban areas instead of running to big uh, e-commerce giants like amex uh, sorry amazon and flipkart etc this i told you 40% of digital payments are ours twice of china and expert three times today cash is and digital is almost 50 50 it'll become 40 60 by 2025 i already talked about digital currency this can happen very soon in another few months and uh, growth in digital transactions promise a very stable and sustained economy with this i end my presentation i hope uh, i have been able to get across to you to explain some of the facets of digital economy how they are already in play how it is got tremendously popular in our country how it has got become uh, today our uh, uh, digital economy is around 11 to 12% of our gdp it's not very accurately measured as i told you globally it's around 50% but we are lower than global uh, but the government is planning to catch up to at least 20% of this economy so when 5 trillion dollar economy comes 20% of that can be digital economy 
which means one trillion dollar digital economy is expected in another four to five years time. This is not my words, conclusion. This is what uh, Rajiv Chandrasekhar said, the minister said of electronics and uh, uh, communication, he said this. This is what the government is expecting. So with this, I uh, end my presentation. If there are any questions which I need to answer, I'll be very glad to take it. Thank you very much.